Hello and welcome to another edition of our Memory Lane podcast here at the DK Pittsburgh Sports Podcasting Network. Very pleased to be joined today by former Pirates catcher Mike Lavalier. And I got to know one thing I've always wanted to know. How, where did the spanky nickname come from, Mike? Well, um, I was playing uh, for uh, the Cardinals AAA team in uh, Louisville, Kentucky, 1985. And my manager was Jim Fagosi. And uh, he all of a sudden just said, well, you know what? You remind me of the Little Rascals character. Your, your nickname is now Spanky. And as well, you know, the best way to keep a nickname is to fight it. I didn't fight it, but it stuck anyway. So Jim Fregosi was the guy that called me that. That's the nickname that stuck. Do you like it? Did it was it endearing for you all these years? <laughs> you know what? I guess it, it, it's, it's one of those things that uh, it, it became an acquired taste. And um, now it just kind of. I, I accept it, and it's uh, actually flattering that, that people know me, uh, you know, still as Spanky. I cannot wait to hear some of your stories on this. Um, but first and foremost, what I like to do with this podcast, Mike, is let folks know what you're doing today. Uh, everybody knows about your baseball career. What are you up to nowadays? Well, uh, right now, I'm pretty much enjoying my family. Uh, I'll be 62 in August. So I'm pretty much retired. Um, I uh, I get my uh, grandson every Thursday and join him. My son and uh, one of my daughters lives here in town, here in Bradenton. So, uh, you know, between them, you know, I spend a lot of time with them. I uh, get over to McKechnie Field and uh, saw a couple of the guys that are still there. Um, and Scott Bonnet, the equipment manager and a couple of his assistants uh, were uh, there whenever I was there. So did uh, did a little reminiscing last week with them. All right. So as fate would have it, we are recording this video on April 1st, April Fool's Day. It was exactly 35 years ago today, April 1st, 1987, uh, that the Pirates made what is widely considered the, their greatest trade of all time. They sent Tony Pena to the St. Louis Cardinals for Mike Dunn, Mike Lavalier, and Andy Van Slyke. And that trade helped spearhead the Buccos uh, to the three straight playoff appearances, 90-91-92. Mike Lavalier, a, a huge part of that. Mike, or Andy Van Slyke, certainly a, a key part of that as well. So it's April Fool's Day, 1987. Can you, can you walk us through, Mike, that trade when you who how you found out what you knew about the pirates did you think it was a joke what, what was going on in your mind that day well um <laughs> you know it's kind of funny about spring training because you have all day games and you really don't really have really a clue of what day it is right, you know, right. is it monday is it sunday you know you're really not sure about you know the dates other than you know the day that you're going to break camp and uh, the day started out like, you know, pretty much any other day. Um, we had a B game scheduled in the morning for some pitchers to get some extra work. Uh, Steve Lake was our other catcher, and he was going to catch the B game. And I was going to catch the A game at Al Lang Stadium later on That's that afternoon. So uh, we're all getting out uh, uh, to the right field line and, getting loose, getting ready to play the game. And Dave Ricketts, the bullpen coach for the Cardinals at the time, comes out and, you know, tells me and Andy that we're not playing. And so I, I had no clue. And, you know, never really understood at the time, you know, what was taking place. Well, as soon as we get in the dugout, it's kind of like, okay, now something's going on. Um, Steve Lake was, he caught the nine inning uh, morning game and he was going to catch the nine inning afternoon game. So, I mean, catching a doubleheader is fairly rare and to do it in spring training, unheard of. So at that point, it was confirmation that I'd no longer be 
with the St. Louis Cardinals. Uh, Andy and I <laughs> were kind of sitting together for a little bit during the game and kind of trying to figure out, well, we're traded to, but, you know, who, who, who's it going to be? And so we discussed it and kind of figured, well, you know, leaving the leaving St. Louis is a, a pretty devastating thing. Great town, great uh, backing uh, from their fans. The organization was having a lot of success. So anywhere that we went, you know, was it was going to be, you know, a tough deal. And, but we had considered two places that we didn't want to go. And it was Montreal and Pittsburgh. <laughs> so so my, my, Montreal for their reasons of just being out of the country and Pittsburgh, because at the time they were losing a hundred games a year. And I think they had lost a hundred games three years in a row. Um, the city itself still kind of reeling from all the drug trials. Um, there wasn't a whole lot of goodwill towards Pittsburgh pirates. Um, so yeah, that was, uh, that was it going in after the game into the locker room and then getting brought into Whitey Herzog's office and Dal Maxville has us in there and says, uh, we traded you to the pirates. Well, if anybody that's had a pet snake um, knows if you kill your pet snake, you're pretty devastated. And that's pretty much what it was at the time. It was, we were going from one of the greatest organizations at the time to one of the organizations that was just really struggling. So, I mean, it, it was, it was, it was pretty tough. Um, came out of the locker room and, you know, told my wife and, kind of head down and, and but the same token, you got to realize that you're a professional. These things happen. It's out of your control. And so Andy and I talked to each other. And, and so we want to make a good impression and get there early. Um, we decided we're going to leave St. Pete. I'm going to pick him up about 630. So we're going to arrive in Bradenton about 7, 715. You know, make sure that we get everything taken care of. Well, unfortunately, the old Skyway was uh, a two-lane road. There was an accident on it. Um, we ended up pulling in at about 11.30 in the morning. So the impression that we were trying to make <laughs> was the exact impression that we didn't want to make, you know, to where, you know, here, we're just going to show up when we want, blah, blah, blah. Um, but Jim Leland, you know, we told him what happened. Obviously understood. He came in and he offered uh, me his jersey number 10 because that's the number I had worn with the Phillies and the Cardinals. And um, I looked in, saw it on his body, and I go, I am not taking the manager's number. I don't know if this is a test or what it is, but, uh, you know, I, you know, still to this day, you know, I, I don't know if Jim was testing me or actually <laughs> if he wanted me to have the, the jersey number, but. You know, I, I, I wasn't about you know, to be like that. But, you know, ultimately, you know, it was devastating at first. But you got to be professional about it and end up being really, I think Andy would, would uh, collaborate to where it was the best thing to happen to us. Right. And when did you when did you kind of figure that out? So you you go from devastated when you find out. But how long did it take once you were there in spring training, got to Pittsburgh? How long did it take for you to maybe think, OK, this actually could be a good situation for us? Well, it really didn't happen till I would say the end of middle to the end of August in a September. Uh, we kind of just kind of treaded water throughout the season. Yeah, we were hanging around 500, but we had a really good end of July or end of August and September. And it was kind of like, well, you know what? You know, I, I, I think we got a pretty good ball club here, you know, uh, and, you know, there were some other moves that were made, you know, uh, Drabeck was there. He came into his own. 
Um, you know, they had made some uh, some other deals where, you know, this is a, a good looking club. And we had a lot of expectations, you know, going out of 87, going into 88. And so I think right then and there, that was kind of like, OK, you know, this is this is going to be a good deal after all. All right. So here we are again. We're recording this uh, 35 years to the day after the trade. If, if you Google best pirates trade ever, um, your trade will be the one that's listed at number one. I'm not sure if you knew that or uh, maybe you are aware of it. But looking back on it now, after all this time, Mike, um, could you have possibly envisioned not only would, would it be a good trade for you, that we would be talking about how huge that trade was 35 years later? Well, again, at the time, you know, being, you know, kind of young and short-sighted, you know, it was kind of reactionary to be, you know, this is awful. But, you know, (laughs) obviously, I think looking back at this time and, you know, still being uh, in touch with a lot of my friends, um, John Smiley and his wife coming down to Bradenton uh, this week, you know, see each other. Um, get to see a few buddies that, you know, when we were able to have our Pirate Fantasy Camp. And I think all of us are, you know, really proud of, of you know, what we accomplished as a team. We didn't get to where, you know, the end game what that we wanted. But, you know, it's I think it's flattering that folks, you know, still remember us as one of the better teams and, you know, if uh, this was one of the better trades, um, you know, there was uh, you know, a lot that went into it. It was a, a total team effort. All right. So let's go to 1990 to 92. Um, there are a lot of different stories, I'm sure, that can be told. And we're going to talk about the ninth inning against the Braves in 92 and the slide and all that. Because I'm very curious, your perspective. You had You had the best view of the play in the whole world as the catcher looking out into left field. But what is your favorite memory? Uh, of those three divisional championship series, Mike? Well, I think, you know, it's, it started before um, the actual playoffs. I think my favorite memory is when we clinched in 1990 in St. Louis. And, and that feeling, you know, a ground ball by uh, uh, Denny Walling to Chico. Chico throws it to Sid. Yeah, and then there's a big giant pile. Trebek said, you know, Chico, myself, well, you know, we're right there. And then the whole team is there. That was probably my fondest memory. <laughs> um, you know, I, I can't say that there's, you know, there was, um, you know, anything more than that first time you do it. You know, the second time, great. Third time, I mean, you appreciate each and every one, but that first uh, clinching was special. You know, the irony of what you just said of your favorite memory, the out ending with Sid Bream. Um, I'm going to stretch this out for a minute because obviously the run ended with Sid Bream for another team. So I want to wait and get to that in one second. But how just how good were those teams, 90-91? When you look back, um, the talent that you had, Barry, Andy Van Slyke, Bobby Bonilla, yourself, Doug Drabeck. Just how, how good do you think those teams were? Well, I think, you know, the biggest thing is, you know, we were a team, we had each other's back, and we came to play every night. And we had accountability to each other, which I think was the most important. And we knew that we had a manager at the time that was going to give us the best chance to win each and every night. So you put that combination together. Yes, there was talent, but I think there was a lot more to it. Um, I thought that, you know, we were, we were an entertaining group. I know we had a lot of fun out there. We played loose. Uh, We were loose before we were loose after uh, and loose during the game. And I think a lot of folks get a chance to see a very exciting team that could do a lot of things. Well, you know, we probably didn't have, as much power as other teams. We didn't strike out as many uh, guys as, as other pitching staffs, but I tell you defensively, we were as good as there was uh, out there at the time. How much was that ability to be able to go to the ballpark and play loose? How much of that was Jim Leland 
how much of it was the makeup and chemistry of the guys in the clubhouse? I think it was a, it was a great combination uh, of all the above. Uh, Jimmy led us to, you know, be ourselves. And, and I remember, you know, one game we, we absolutely got smashed. I mean, slaughtered and, and came in and like nobody put on the, 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 the radio, you know, and, and Jimmy came in and just says, well, yeah, we're not going to cry about this. Turn on the music. I mean, what the heck, you know, and that was kind of, you know, one of the things that, you know, we knew that we cared each and every night to win, but we weren't going to do that. And so why hang your head with something that you can't do anything about? Let's go ahead and let's just start getting it right for the next day. There's the very famous spring training video uh, of Jim Leland griping at Barry Bonds. Um, were you there for that? And how, how much how much was was it understood that Jim Leland was the leader of the team? <laughs> I was about 15 feet away. Okay. So uh, yeah, I uh, yeah I got a, a up close and, and personal uh, view of the entire situation. And what are you thinking? Uh, what are you thinking when he's telling Barry all that stuff? <laughs> Well, I, I, I saw this unfold. It was um, uh, Bill Verdon. Bill wasn't getting the effort that he wanted out of Barry. So Bill barked at Barry, and Barry said something very unflattering to Bill Verdon, and that's kind of not something you do. Well, in earshot, Jim Leland, I think, caught this and started on a pretty good pace right towards us, and he was probably about, 50 yards away. And now Bill and Barry are about nose to nose and Jim comes in and just basically takes over the conversation. And I think it's pretty, you know, widely known, you know, that was something that Jim did early in, you know, his tenure with the pirates, but I think it gave him or might've been one of the best things that he ever did as a manager because right then and there, you know, he got in the face of one of our very best players and it kind of made an impression on the whole ball club. How good was Barry Bonds at that, during that stage of his career when you were with him? Well, you know, after that uh, particular moment, you know, Barry was a very good offensive player. Um, I think, Bill Verdon woke up something in Barry defensively and Barry became the very best defensive left fielder. So, you know, it was something that happened, whether that was the, uh, the one thing that got Barry going or it was something shortly thereafter. And I don't believe it's a coincidence, but that, that particular moment, you know, Barry turned himself into the very best player. All right. I want to fast forward to 92, um, the the ninth inning. And you probably know this. This story makes Pirates fans cry (laughs) to this day. Um, But the bases are loaded. I want to get your perspective because this is we've heard uh, Sid Bream's perspective on this many times. Bases are loaded. Francisco Cabrera comes up and you're up two to one. Stan Belinda pitching. What did you know about Francisco Cabrera? You're the catcher. Catchers know something about everybody, you know, leaders of the team. What, what, what did you know about Francisco coming into that at bat? Well, it, it just uh, basically the one thing, because there wasn't a, a lot of history on him, but the one thing that we knew is he could hit a fastball. Mm-hmm. You know, we started him off with a breaking ball that missed and another breaking ball that missed. So now we, you know, uh, now we're kind of playing into his game. He yep. knows he's getting a fastball. You know, he rips one foul, and then the next pitch he, he gets his base hit. So, you know, something that, you know, uh, in hindsight, you know, do you do anything different? Nah. You know what the, the book on him was? He, he couldn't handle the breaking ball. Yeah. So, and, you know, that's that's how we went at him to start with. And so it's 2-0, and o, and it changes the whole – complexion of the at-bat, right? You, you limited some of the things Stan Belinda could do probably in that situation. Right? Well, that's that, that there's no, there's no chance that we can throw another breaking ball after missing yeah. with the first two. So we got to come in with the fastball and now it's two and one, 
And and still to this point where you don't want to go three balls, especially with the bases loaded. With a base open, maybe that changes things. But with the bases loaded, all right, hey, look, you know, we got to come with what stands best pitch. You know, his fastball, even though that's that's um, Cabrera's um, uh, his strength. So it's kind of strength against strength. And uh, the hitter won that time. Okay. This is I'm looking forward to this as much as any question I could possibly ask you, because the balls hit to left field. You're the catcher. You see everything. You've got the entire panoramic view of the ball going to Barry. You see Sid around third. The catcher has, we saw it on, everybody's seen it on TV in the video a thousand times. You're watching this play out live. Mike, what did you see? What are you thinking? Sid's rounding third. You see where Barry's got the ball. You see the position he's at. What is going through your mind for a three to five second period here? Well, I mean, it's just you can revert back to your your training. You know, it just uh, you know, don't get ahead of yourself, you know, and 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 you know, you as a catcher, you know, obviously we're not gonna, you know, relay the ball. We're not gonna be able to get sit out if you know, it, you know, the ball has to come from Barry right to me. You know, so that's one of the equations that gets thrown out. You know, it's gotta be Barry to me or we don't have a chance. Um, so that, that, you know, that makes your decision-making a little bit easier. Uh, I knew Sid got a great jump off of second base. We knew that, you know, he doesn't run as well as, you know, a lot of guys, but still getting that good jump was, you know, the reason, you know, why he was called safe. I'm not <laughs> saying you're safe. Let's get to, let's say that for a second, but you're seeing Sid, every player, every baseball player knows, I've got a shot at this or I don't. You're seeing where Sid is. You're seeing where Barry is. Are you thinking you're going to get him or are you thinking we're in trouble here? I, I, I actually thought that uh, it, it was going to be close that we didn't have a chance. That's okay, how you, good of a jump that Sid got off a of second base. So you thought you, know, you, so, you, you see him rounding third and are you thinking he's going to score? Yeah, it's it's you know it, it, there's a inner clock, you know in in your mind mm-hmm. that's it, this ticking, and the ticking is is taking too long mm-hmm. for me, and it's like well you, you obviously you don't give up on anything, but you know at the same token it's like click click okay now we're we're getting close to the bomb to go off here you know something needs to happen <laughs> so you know and then the ball comes in you know I catch it I dive back. And then, uh, then uh, the debate starts. So the ball's up the first baseline a little bit. You dive back. Is it your contention? Uh, what's this? Uh, Thirty years later, that you got him out. Well, here's my deal. When you bet leg slide, your top foot, your lead foot is off the ground. It can't be digging into the ground or your spikes, you'll, you'll break an ankle. Uh, going into any of the bases, that's easy. Going in second, going in third, because they're above ground. Elevated, right. Home plate's level, level with the ground. So my contention is I dove back. I got his back leg before his back leg hit home plate. And with the front foot still up, you think the exactly. front foot was still up? That's my contention. I, I still believe he was out. Have you watched the replay one time, five times, a thousand times, 10,000 times? Um, let's just say a couple times. Okay. Um, I've had, I've had, uh, I, I've done some, um, I've done some announcing for ESPN. I've had um, their guys, you know, kind of analyze it. Um, there wasn't enough angles right. for them to definitively say, right. you know, uh, and and if there was, um, if there was 
a challenge back then. It probably would have been challenged, but according to the angles that they had, it would have been inconclusive. Um, so, you know, Sid, you know, he's, he, he's a great guy. One of my very good friends. He says he's safe. I say he's out, but ultimately the umpire called him safe. So, you know, that's, that's what we all had to live with. Yeah. Uh, that's a great perspective. And, you know, those were great teams. Um, here we are. We're 30 years later. The pirates did get back to the playoffs, 2013, 14, 15, but they had a 20 year losing streak. Uh, obviously in the meantime, after 92, do you look back on 90, 91, 92, with a lot of pride and excitement and enjoyment of what you accomplished, or is there some level of bittersweetness that uh, you, you just weren't able to get to the series and, and, and win it all? Well, you know, obviously, you know, to win it all is, is your goal, you know, each and every year, you know, coming out of spring training, you know, it's like, all right, we know we've got a chance. And in those years, I mean, it was legitimate. I think, you know, after 90, you know, maybe, you know, 91, we were one of the favorites in 92. They have to call us the favorite. Uh, for us not to finish the deal, you know, obviously it's disappointing, but it's, you know, that's uh, it, it's something that I'm thankful that, you know, we had the chance. And, and that's the one thing as a player, you know, you always want a chance to win. And if you, you you do, then, you know, you get the big pig pile at the end of the year and that's the greatest feeling. But if you don't, you, you look back, you did everything you possibly could. It just wasn't good enough. Did you know personally and was there a feeling within the team when it ended in 92 that that era was over? Did, did you know? Not to know, not to think that they would lose for twenty consecutive years, but you knew where baseball was heading. You knew financially. You knew Barry's future. Did 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 you feel like? Was there a general feeling that 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 era was was going to be over quickly? Well, we got you know a little bit of a feeling, you know, and you know, John Smiley being traded, you know, that was that was something you know precursor to you know what was ultimately going to take place you know we we all pretty much knew that Barry was going to go but we also thought you know we have a good nucleus you know if we can hold on to our pitching you know and then you know Dougie uh ends up signing with Houston and that was pretty much that that, that was the end um we knew at that point just a matter of time before they were going to dismantle you know the team you know, we have it. We gave it a great run. You know, we'd like to have, you know, one, two, five more chances, but you know, it wasn't to be. And you know, that's part of the game. And what happened with you with the Pirates the following year, Mike? Well, that's uh, started off uh, spring training. Um, you know, everything was, you know, hey, look, you know what? We've we've got a solid team here. You know, let's see what we can do. Uh, came out of spring training. I was a little banged up, missed a couple games. And then um, Easter Sunday, 1993, I was called in the office and uh, was given my release. And um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to finish my career in Pittsburgh. You know, I love the city of Pittsburgh. I uh, had uh, purchased a, a home in Wexford. Um, I thought there was pretty good roots there. And you know, unfortunately, I wasn't able to do that. And, you know, it wasn't my choice. Um, at the time, I was a player rep for the uh, Pirates. We were going through, you know, labor negotiations. I was I don't know, maybe a, a little too outspoken. I'm not sure. Uh, that's, a, you know, a question better answered by the management at the time, um, you know, versus myself. Um, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd still... If, if, if I could still fit in a pirate uniform, I'd be wearing it. <laughs> All right. There's one other thing I want to ask you about, a baseball-related question. Uh, I'm from Little Rock, Arkansas, so I grew up uh, early on as a St. Louis Cardinals fan. So I watched all those Jackrabbit teams with Vince Coleman and uh, Willie McGee and Ozzie Smith. Uh, then I became a Chicago Cubs fan, Mike, and, and, and Sean Dunstan was my favorite player. So, uh, but I did watch the Cardinals a lot growing up, and I loved that style of baseball, running the bases, stealing all kinds of bases. 
you would have played with all those guys. The game is completely different now. That nobody steals. I think Ricky and and Vince Coleman stole more bases themselves than teams did last year. Mike, you're probably aware of that. Maybe you're not. You were a terrific catcher throwing runners out. I'm just curious what what you think about the way the game has evolved. That nobody runs anymore. Everybody's just looking for kind of the home run. What what do you make of that specific aspect of how baseball's changed? Well, uh, it, it, this much I can tell you, I haven't seen a game in two years. So that tells you how much, you know, I think of the game right now. I don't care for the style. It's, it's uh, I, you know, I'd go down to my local, uh, you know, softball field and, and, and watch slow pitch. You know, that's kind of what it is. You, you strike out or you get a home run. Um, it's not the baseball that I grew up, um, you know, watching and loving and playing. It's a different style of game. You know, uh, the, the fans are, are showing up. So, you know what, it's, it's something that somebody likes. I think a lot of it has to do with how beautiful the ballparks are. Not so much how beautiful what's inside the ballparks playing is anymore. I think it's become a very fan-friendly atmosphere. You know, I, I, th- I think the concessions, I think all the games, all the different things that families can can do with the kids around the ballpark, I think that has a lot to do with the experience uh, as far as the game playing, uh, it doesn't suit me at all. I, I don't like it. Uh, I, I think it's um, very robotic. And to me, it's as boring as can be. But you're not alone in that, right? I mean, I've talked to a, a lot of former players. Al Oliver was on our podcast recently. He said, you know, he doesn't watch the game. W- would you say that a lot of former players are in the same mindset as you, that the game is just so different, it's harder to watch? is pretty much simplified into, you know, hitting a home run or, or striking out. There's, you know, the really, you know, the, the idea of moving runners over, hitting the ball the opposite field to get a runner on base, button them over, stealing a run here and there. You know, the, the old, you know, get them over, get them in, you know, that's no longer part of it. And that's the way that we were all brought up in the game is to do all those fundamentals and to pretty much eliminate all that stuff. It just that to me, it's not worth watching. Interesting. Mike, those are great stories. I cannot thank you enough for uh, taking the time to share all your memories with the pirates on our memory lane podcast. Uh, You said you wanted to finish your career in Pittsburgh. Are Are you still in touch with folks up this way, either within the pirate organization or just people around Pittsburgh? Well, they, you know what, there's uh, I still have a lot of good friends, you know, in the Pittsburgh area. There's a lot of guys that come down for the pirate fantasy camp that live in the Pittsburgh area. So I stay in touch with those guys. You know, my main liaison with the pirates is Joe Billadu. He's our alumni director. He, you know, he does a fabulous job of, uh, you know, corralling all of us old goats. Uh, and, and, you know, keeping us in line and keeping us involved with the organization. And uh, without Joe, yeah, I think they, uh, you know, the, the, the game would have lost a bunch of us. And, uh, you know, our hats off to, uh, to Joe for doing such a great job with us. Part of the greatest trade in Pirates history. Mike Laval, you're a big part of that success from 90 to 92. The trade happened on April Fool's Day, 35 years. Pretty amazing. Mike, thank you so much for your time. It's my pleasure, Corey. Thank you. Thank you.